soon as the battle started, about four or five of them fell on me, and oh boy, did I start dodging. My first I got with a full deflection shot from underneath. He went down in a long glide, and I went into a spin as two others were firing at me from aft. I pulled left and up. I then saw Messerschmitt trying to fire up at me, so I went head on at him. We were both firing and everything was red flashes. I killed the pilot because suddenly he pulled right at me and missed me by inches. I went over the top of him and as I turned, saw him rear right up in the stall and go down with his engine smoking. He was out of control and half on his back. My engine was badly shot up and caught fire. I turned everything off. The fire went out and I glided down. There was a lot of glycol and I couldn't see anything much. I turned the petrol on again. The engine ran for a little while and then everything seized and a lot of fumes and smoke came into the cockpit. So I prepared to land undercarriage up. This I did successfully, only to get a knock on the nose which bled like a pig. The old girl burst into flames, and as you can imagine, I moved pretty quickly. I'd landed just east of Boulogne. I thought, of course, that I was well behind our lines. And then, to my rage and astonishment, a German motorbike came round the corner, and I was taken prisoner. Please ask Hollis to send me the standard law books, like Salmond, and also all the quarterlies, so I can keep my hand in. A cheap set of Shakespeare would be grand. I was three years old when Hitler personally ordered the execution of my uncle, Roger Buschel. Throughout our childhood, he gazed down on us. He smiled at us. He winked at us, and we winked back. Every summer, we spent our holidays in my grandparents' house in Hermanus, a small fishing village on the South African Cape coast. After lunch, my sister and I would play or laze about in my grandfather's study while the elders slept. My grandfather instilled in us a love for Britain. He read us Rudyard Kipling. We grew up believing that the British were best. We read about Roger from Paul Brickhill's book, The Great Escape. But what we longed for most was that he would walk through the gate so that we could leap into his arms. But this he never did. My uncle Roger Bushell masterminded the great escape of World War II. In 1963, Hollywood made a film about it. This time we'll dig straight down 30 feet before we go horizontal. That'll rule out any question of sound detection or probing. All right, Roger. Devote Roger Bushell's role as Big X was played by Richard Attenborough. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits. As well. Meanwhile, we dig. Hold on to yourself, Bartlett. You're 20 feet short. What do you mean, 20 feet short? You're 20 feet short of the woods. My mother and I attended the premiere of the film in London. I was 22, 
and I sat next to Wing Commander Harry Day, who was Roger's senior commanding officer. They were together as prisoners throughout the war. Todd met Richard Attenborough afterwards at the sort of reception that they had, and he said to her, I was wrong in the part, wasn't I? And she said, yes, frankly, you were. You weren't a bit like my brother. And, of course, they changed his name to Bartley or something, which annoyed me intensely. But they did it, apparently, to um, safeguard themselves against any criticism from the family, so I suppose one got accepted. Squadron leader Bartlett, if you will escape again and be caught, you will be shot. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. In all those years we spent in my grandfather's study, we never found the meticulous records he made of Roger's life. Only very recently we found them all in one place. Childhood, youth, youth into manhood, photographs, letters, certificates, newspaper clippings, small notes and wry comments all sealed away for two generations to keep tragedy at bay. My grandmother's diary begins it all. For a week after his birth, he lost weight steadily, and one night his life hung by so slender a thread that the nursing sister, a Roman Catholic, implored me to let her christen him. Roger, Joyce, Bushel. I baptize you. After she had the said Father, the lovely words, and of the Son, she and laid of him the in Holy my arms. Spirit. Drops of holy water still lay on his queer, wrinkled forehead. All fear for my beloved little son left me. I knew that he would live. He was my mother's brother. He called her Todd's. They grew up on a gold mine at West Springs on the South African Gold Reef. They did everything together. If it was bird watching, my mother was sent along the branch first to see if it would break. My mother's dolls were burnt at the stake. Roger could spit a phenomenal distance. They had one small dog called Rubbish because he was found on a rubbish heap and they had a much younger sister called Elizabeth. Like many boys at the time, Roger was sent to senior school in England. He only ever returned to South Africa once or twice. I suppose because we didn't see so much of him, uh, he was sort of glamorized. Stuffiness and, and being hidebound by rules and regulations were not his scene at all. He did cock a snook at authorities. When he left Wellington, the headmaster wrote to Daddy and said that he really didn't think he could teach Roger anything more. And he suggested that Roger went to West Africa, you know, the service. And my father wrote back and said he thought he knew a bit more about West Africa than the headmaster did, and no son of his was going there. And that was when he went to Grenoble. Roger was only 15 when he first skied at Marin. But even in those days, he counted in any company. In 1931, age 20, he won the Langlau at Scheidig Oberland. In later years, he was one of the great characters in St. Moritz. And the uncrowned king of the fashionable Italian skiing center at Sestrier. Sometimes as a racer, Roger had far more courage than judgment and threw away many races through recklessness. In an attempt to overtake Frank Campbell of McGill, he fell on a swift downhill run, broke both skis and lacerated his left eye. However, when the rescue team went to pick him up, he said he intended to go on. The team needs every point, he protested. They'll lose if I don't continue. He was restrained and sent to hospital. But 
behind his gaiety and nonsense, which is joie de vivre, and a touch also of joie de vice, is an unceasing or underlying purpose and a strong will to carry it out. Loving as he is fundamentally, he will never let his heart completely control his head, and so he will grow into a fine man. My worst food memory, I suppose going to dinner at the, at the Savoy and dancing. And as the clock struck 12 and I became 17, he said, right, now I'm going to show you how people really kiss. And I went down the, down the drain and came up for air about two minutes later. <laughs> I was, he said, well, there you are, now you know. You know, sweet 17 and never kissed before, sort of. Which wasn't entirely true, but still. There were very few people who had the experience that Roger had on the female sex, I can assure you. He had many girlfriends, many, many girlfriends. Someday you come along, the man I love. Very often a married one and a rich one. And I mean, he used to go to the same tailor as Daddy and have you know, things made up, and then the bills came in. And father hit the roof. He moved into a world that was completely different to anything that Benji had been in. Look at me and smile. Benji didn't countenance the fact that Roger was always stony broke. He got mad as a snake about this, but he didn't realize that living in London was a great deal more expensive than living in South Africa and certainly in Springs. What Roger never realized was that although Benji had a very big position at the mine, and he had a lot of perks. I mean, he had a car and a chauffeur and God knows how many gardeners and, and a house. and Actual cash, I don't think he had all that amount. He didn't consider Roger needed that amount of money because he, he, didn't, he didn't need it. He'll build a little home Just meant for two From which I never know Skiing and flying were his great loves. He was a member of the Auxiliary Air Force. He was 601 Squadron. And they spent a fortnight, I think it was a year, out of various aerodrome doing training. And they used to spend their life sort of getting sacks of flour or something and dive bombing 600. Very, very full of beans, full of jokes. And, but that was all sort of rather childish fun that went on each year. but they were very serious about their flying. It's that silly-ass Hitler again, just back by flying boat from the south of France. Embodied yesterday. Address 601 Hendon. Don't worry. I'm fighting fit. All love, Roger. Roger was embodied by the RAF as a squadron leader. He took a couple of his friends from 601 and formed Squadron 92. By the time Roger sent the telegram to his parents on August the 26th, 1939, Adolf Hitler had already annexed Austria and occupied Czechoslovakia. Six days after the telegram arrived, German divisions broke into Poland. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany.
Rogers Squadron 92 traded Blenheim planes for Spitfires. Pilots spoke of the clear-cut beauty of the Spitfire with its Rolls-Royce engine and that flying them was like an extension of their own bodies, brains and nervous system. On the morning of May the 23rd, 1940, Squadron 92 was ordered to patrol the French coastline. Roger was shot down at this juncture during the retreat of the British Army at Dunkirk. I remember the telegram arriving saying that Roger had been killed. Well, we were all absolutely devastated. And I went back to Varsity and I was in some show. And the chap who was producing it was an absolute darling. And I remember him taking me out for coffee or something after we'd had a rehearsal and saying, look, don't take it because I bet you he's a prisoner of war. And my God, two days later or something, came the news that he was. Oh, he was, he was everything. In fact, someone once said to me during the war, you know, you'll never get a husband if you keep on measuring him up to your brother. And I think that was my basic thing. Thirty-first of July, 1940. My darlings, you will know by now that I'm a prisoner of war and alive and well. I understand that I had some flattering obituary notices, so I'm afraid you must have had a bad time. I hardly know where to start. As we are only allowed this one single sheet of paper, my news will be sketchy. I was shot down in a big battle with Messerschmitts. I got two of them first, so I have done something to help win the war. Do you remember how I told you at the beginning of the war that I knew I'd get through it? Well, admittedly, I never thought it would be this way, but I'm convinced now all my energies, bottled up for the time being, are meant to be used later on. My dear Uncle Harry, my flat, as you know, I shared with Michael Peacock. We owed the people a certain amount of rent because, of course, with the declaration of war, our circumstances were very much altered. This letter gives you full authority to act on my behalf. He and Michael Peacock, they had a flat in Tite Street in Chelsea. They shared the car, they shared everything. Because if one had a tail coat, the other one couldn't go out in a tail coat that night. They had this wonderful sort of uh, carefree existence. And they had an old girl called Mrs. Robinson who was their char. Well, I must say, must have been an absolute saint the way she coped with him. But I mean, trust them to find someone like that. In 1936, when he was actually working as a barrister, he and Michael Peacock joined up as juniors in Karki's chambers. I think they did all the sort of minor cases that were no money attached. And they also went down into what is the East End once a week to give advice to people who had legal problems, sort of free gratis and for nothing because it was experience. And quite a few of them got into the newspapers. He really did have the gift of the gab. I mean, he could talk his way into anything and out of anything, you know and swore like a trooper at times. And he had this rather fat chuckle. I mean, they did their job and they did the job well. Both he and Michael were very good, I think, as law. I mean, I think he was quite liable to go out most of the night, sort of thing, to come in and have to be in court at nine o'clock the next morning. 
Well, thank God they did. Poor Mike, I'm afraid, is dead. Michael Peacock was killed three days before Roger was captured. Life here is very peaceful and we are extremely well treated. I had a delightful birthday party with whiskey sent over by the Commandant, who is a charming fellow. I have many books, all the old classics, and I have a whole set of Shakespeare, which is a great joy. And several parcels of popular games like backgammon, chess, and those absurd puzzles have arrived from Harrods. I have all that's necessary to bodily comfort. Only that devil, the human mind, makes one go crazy at times. Something of greater value beckons him on, and the image of it shines in his curiously dilated pupils. At times, only a rim of brilliant blue shines around them. Were his goal solely a material one, I'd be anxious. My dear Uncle Harry, I would be grateful if you'd get in touch with Miss Peggy Hamilton, 9 Wellesley House, Sloan Square, 8469. We were going to get married if I'd not ended up here, and we are going to get married as soon as this bloody war is over. I've written to Cox and Kings and told them that I wish my pay to be made over to her. My account at Barclays Bank is overdrawn, but I have a life insurance to cover it. My darling mummy, your letters are the greatest joy. Please don't think they're boring. Letters are wonderful things when you're a prisoner. I'm so glad Peggy Hamilton wrote you. She is, I'm quite sure, the only person in the world for me, and I know that you will adore her. I want you to buy a really lovely diamond off Oppie, which I'll arrange to pay for out of my pay and to send it to her and tell her to have it made into a ring. While I'm a prisoner, it's probably the only time that I'll have enough money to buy her something really good. It drives me almost frantic, with London being bombed, to feel that Peggy is there, nursing in the middle of it. One is liable to become vague, I find. So shut away from the world are we. Papers and the wireless bring the war into perspective for a moment, but the context is an artificial one and we carry on in our community in splendid isolation from the struggle and tragedy of it all. The first snow has fallen. The air is like wine, and the snow has that creaky, squeaky crunch that makes me so homesick for Switzerland and a pair of skis. We went out today in beautiful powder snow crisp fresh air, blue sky, and all the trees loaded with snow. It was too beautiful for words. Believe it or not, we bought skis through the canteen and use Red Cross boots and go out on the local hills with the German officers. You can imagine what it does to us. And then, of course, one gets outside the old barbed wire. Life is like a jigsaw puzzle. We fiddle with the pieces, put them this way and that, try to fit one with the other, but it's of no use. They will only go one way. And finally, we have to find it.
I am the first of the family ever to take this journey across Europe to find out as much as I can about Roger's dogged life of escape and captivity. The exhilaration of getting outside the old barbed wire onto skis again inspired Roger's first escape. While he and Wings Day and others located the German Luftwaffe at Dullag Luft, they were simultaneously digging a tunnel to get out. The others agreed that Roger would leave the day before the tunnel attempt. Roger outlined his plan to hide in a goat shed overnight before catching trains south to the Swiss border. With his fluency in German, he set course for Switzerland, traveling by day in a civilian suit bought from one of the guards at Dullag Luft. I was able to engage in brief conversations and navigated with the aid of guidebooks purchased from shops along the way. I went to Tutlingen by express train and from there to Bondorf by suburban line. From Bondorf, I reached on foot the point I was making for, just a few kilometers from the Swiss border. Things had gone almost too well, so I sat down for two hours and made myself generate caution for the last decisive stage. I had the alternatives of waiting for nightfall with all its problems or of bluffing it out by daylight, and I chose the latter. Roger discovered that he'd been only a hundred yards from the Swiss border at that moment when he paused to consider. Alas, in the border village of Stullingen, he was halted by a guard. Pretending to be a drunken but amiable ski instructor and speaking German, he was being conducted towards a checkpoint for an examination of his papers when he broke loose and bolted, dodging bullets into a side street, which alas, proved to be a cul-de-sac, and he was run to earth within minutes. Escaping meant punishment, and Roger was sent to Stalagluft II on the Baltic, starkly different from Dullagluft. June 21st, 1941. My darlings, I've changed my address. Apologies for not writing last month. I left the camp without asking, having decided it was so long since I'd seen my friends. Ghastly bad luck stopped me literally right at the last moment. I was within a hundred yards and could have taken a girl's school across when I paused. Almost all the old crowd from Dulag have collected here. Yes, the next time I saw him was in the summer of 1941, after the Dulag Dorf tunnel through which about 18 or 20 escaped. Now, previous to that, we thought they were um, just having a good time down at Dulag. There was a, a, a permanent staff, and um, they were enjoying the fruits of the German occupation of France and captured British stocks and so on. And they got a fairly cold reception when they came in through the gate, but, of course, when we heard that they had dug a tunnel and escaped, the attitude changed entirely. Letters are our only link with the real world. One writes not knowing what number of people read them, and one tries to pretend the complicated machinery of censorship does not exist. I still have not heard from Peggy. All my books left at the last camp. Splendid of John to subscribe to my parcels. The best would be cigarettes. Several shops like Harrods know the ropes. Actually, in this camp, we've had no parcels. You'll be speechless to hear that I got on the scale at 12 stone 4 pounds, 26 pounds lighter than on arrival. The Germans began by saying to everybody, they said to me, for you, the war is over. It isn't. It's still going on. 
you must also never forget that you're on the winning side. And you must remind the Germans of that. If, if they know that you speak German, you'll speak German to them as often as you can. You take an air of convinced superiority to them. This could annoy some of the rare area Germans who are looking after prisoner war camps very much indeed, of course, and was deliberately harped on by men as clever as Roger, who were good at it. My second birthday just passed as an unwilling guest in this country. He uh, uh, very soon made himself felt, if not heard. I mean, if you didn't meet him, you heard him talking around the compound or expressing his views of the Germans. As far as I can see, I'm likely to spend one more birthday here before the war is over. All my love, Roger. He escaped again with a Czech pilot seven years younger than him, Jarka Zafuk. I first met Roger in a prison near Hamburg. We got to know that the Germans are going to move the whole camp and transport all of us by train to somewhere in Germany. Roger managed to get some German money and all sorts of things necessary for escape and got some food coupons out of the German guard for some cigarettes. I had a good plan for an escape route. Bye the middle of 41, anybody going on an Air Force raid over enemy-occupied territory or anybody going on a commando raid had one of Clayton Hutton's escape boxes in, his, in the trouser pocket of his battle dress, which included food for a few days of assault, chocolate and Horlicks tablets, water purifying tablets, a tiny little water bottle, a fish hook, a little thread in case your clothes got torn, a saw and a compass. The Germans put 30 of us in one cattle truck with two guards. It was quite dark inside and we took out our saws and started sawing the board on one end of the truck. There were another four boys and everybody took his turn. After about an hour and a half of sewing, we managed to loosen the board and took it inside. Around about midnight, the train came to a large goods station where it slowed down a bit and we decided to go. We jumped. After we got to our feet, both of us ran across about three rails and hid underneath a stationary train waiting till our train passed and to see whether all is clear for us to get up and dash for freedom. Everything seemed quiet, so we got up, ran back again across the rails, jumped the fence. We changed into our homemade civvy clothes. Both of us looked more like two masqueraders than anything else. We stayed in the field till the day broke out. Then we found in the vicinity a stream where we washed ourselves and made ready for our next move. We knew roughly where we were and went to the station there, we found a cinema that was open and went inside to hide ourselves until came the time for us to catch the train to Dresden. From now on, everything went according to our plan. To get to Prague, to get in touch with the Czech underground people who would help us to get either to Switzerland or to some other neutral country. In Prague, Jarka Zafuk's girlfriend recognized him on a tram. It was in 1941. I was coming back from a date, I think it was, and uh, there was some man standing on the streetcar inside, 
uh, with glasses, moustache. And I look at him and I said, oh my God, it must be him. And that was Yarka. And that's how we got back together. Vlasta Zafouk flew back to Prague from Montreal to tell me what she remembered of the time when Roger and Yarka were there in hiding. I always will remember Roger because he made quite an impression on me. He was really, really something different. Brave, crazy, ready to take any chance just to get what he wanted. Exceptional man. Roger would take any chance to get away, steal an aeroplane, we'll do this, we'll do that. That's where they, they went on together very well, except these little moments when, when he got into that mood and he wanted out. When they came to Prague, Apparently, they stayed with um, Schumbera, but then they had to go out because the people got scared. Yarka knew Ota, and he said, well, I'll talk to my sister and to my father and see if they agree, and then they agreed, so they went and stayed there. It was against the law to be in resistance, and the, the penalty was pull to the back of the next straight way, or get sent off to a labour camp and be worked to death. Not only for you, but for all your family as well. You put not only yourself, but all your relatives at risk if you went into resistance. They stayed in this house on the third floor. Their name was Seidheimer. Blaja, Otta, and the father. Blaja, she was a very good-looking girl, blonde, voluptuous, uh, nice, lots of fun to talk to. And Ota, I didn't see him very much either because he was in the uh, army and he came home now and then for a visit. And later on, I think he worked for the underground. You had to be so careful because there were so many spies. Just before the Zeitheimler family hid Roger and Jarka Zafuk, Reinhard Heydrich, Hitler's head of secret state police and the criminal police, became the third Reich protector of Czechoslovakia. Lots of killing, lots of arrests. You only have to do a little bit of thing, they arrested you right away. He was hated, absolutely hated. So how would you find, you know, somebody who had all the power really to do, crush you if, you, if you tried even to do anything? All universities were closed and everybody had to go to work. It was Heydrich who had signed and set in motion what the Third Reich called the final solution to the Jewish question. Since Heydrich came, people got more afraid, so we stayed more inside. In this particular house, nobody knew they were there. All of us play cards, amuse ourselves as much as we could. There was no TV that time, only radio. While 20,000 Jews were being removed from Prague's Jewish quarter, the people of Prague began to feel uncomfortable in their own streets, and Roger tried to kill time in the apartment. Roger, I don't know what he did all day. I asked him several times, he said he read, uh, he read, I suppose, 
poor Roger, stuck being alone there all day, and Blaja, looking so <laughs> good, you know, they got involved together. There was a war going on, and during the war, lots of things happened which normally probably wouldn't have happened. And Blaja probably thought she wanted to marry him after the war. And he told her, Roger said, no, I can't marry you. I can't because, because I'm already engaged in England. Whatever, she got very hurt. And she had a boyfriend before the war, and she called him up and told him everything. And he was the one who gave them away to Gestapo for money. I was supposed to work in the afternoon, and the girl who changed with me come to me and says, can I work in the morning next week? For me, it didn't make any difference, so I said, fine. If it happen didn't happen, I would have been there in the morning with them. That would have been the end of me. Yarka told me that uh, Roger got very angry at the Gestapo man, and I think he hit him. So the Roger was beaten quite a bit because with his hot temper, he was opposing. And uh, Yarka, I'm sure he got more than he told me. He, he didn't like talking about it. Roger came face to face with fascism for the first time. He had been associated with the Czech resistance and this enraged the Germans. We know that he refused to give the names of the Zeitheimler family and that he was severely treated as a result. There was one rule about being interrogated, which was universal, uh, which Roger would have picked up and applied particularly in secret services. He would say nothing at all for the first 48 hours to give everybody who was in touch with you a chance to scup. The father was arrested right away. The son was arrested right away. And Blaja was going around with no problem at all. I never came around this place again. This is the first time after, what is it, 65 years? Sad, sad, remembering all those good things. Because that time, I was quite happy, in spite of all the misery going around. Heydrich wasn't only the Reich protector in Czechoslovakia. He remained also head of the Reichssicherheitshauptamt, the main German party secret service, and therefore had a lot of secrets locked up in his head which would die with him if somebody could manage to kill him. He was therefore a legitimate objective for any secret service. About 20 Czechs were sent up to one of SOE training camps in Scotland, and two of them were settled on eventually. And they went off into Prague. Orders came from Berlin to shoot everybody who was under suspicion, which happened also that Blaja was taken in also. The Gestapo shot the Zeithamler family.
It is possible that Roger was taken to Berlin in the very week of Heydrich's state funeral, a time of high emotion and the Reich's unabated fury at his death. Heinrich Himmler hält die Gedenkrede auf Reinhard Heydrich. It was sheer bad luck for Roger that this assassination took place just two weeks after he'd been arrested. The Gestapo seemed to think that he was a British Secret Service agent and that between the time of his escape and his re-arrest six months later, he had been back in London. They believed that he'd been dropped back into Czechoslovakia in a parachute, like the Czech assassins, to help ferment an insurrection at the same time. I remember as a girl asking my mother whether what was happening in South Africa wasn't the same evil Roger had fought against. She told me I knew nothing about World War II, which was true, but I was right. Each generation makes its choice of whether or not to create and nurture a culture of fear. This is the infamous Prince Albrechtstrasse, the ruined site of Heydrich's SS headquarters. The secret police turned the studios of the School of Industrial Arts into interrogation cells. Here, the enemies of Hitler's Third Reich were interrogated. All its political and religious opponents, artists, musicians, writers and intellectuals, it is very likely that Roger was interrogated here in these cells. The rule was, you're compelled by the Geneva Convention to give your name and rank or your name and number. Beyond that, you are entitled to say nothing. Roger will have had a very difficult month in Berlin, probably being interrogated alternately by the hard man and the soft man. Soft man giving him a cigarette and apologizing to him for the dreadful manners of the hard man. The hard man bark, bark, barking at him all the time. Threatening him with physical torture, probably not applying it. Not many prisoners of war were actually tortured. They would use threats and things like that, you see, and hope that you felt you were weak enough to fall for it. They're quite likely to take your boots off and trample on your toes which will break quite a lot of people up quite fast. But if you're bloody enough minded, and Roger was good at being bloody minded, you can set up to that. You were pretty cautious. One knew what was happening, but uh, you could go along with it to a small degree and then divert off, take them off, off, the, off the centers, you might say. But there are some things that you never admit such as what code you're using, if you're using a code, such as who you were staying with. You simply don't admit that. If you showed any fear or anything like that, I mean, you'd, you'd have had it, really. You, ha you had to put on a very brave front. Roger was one of those people whose face is the window of their spirit. When all was well, there was a light within. When he was thwarted or wrongly judged, the light dimmed. And he was thought to be morose, 
when he was actually deeply perturbed or unhappy. Relations between the Gestapo and the rest of the German armed forces were often pretty chill. The Luftwaffe liked to keep its prisoners to itself and was inclined, if the Gestapo had got hold of a prisoner of war, to see whether they couldn't intervene and get him back out of Gestapo hands into a more normal prisoner of war environment. Roger was held for three months. His release from the Gestapo was greatly helped by the intervention of two Germans, Oberleutnant von Massow, an intelligence officer who had known and liked Roger at Dolag Luft and even taken him out to dinner in Frankfurt, an Oberst von Lindeiner, a newly appointed commandant of Stalag Luft III. Roger took this same journey with the Gestapo, Berlin to Sagen, where Göring had built his model camp, specifically designed to prevent prisoners from escaping, Stalag Luft III. When he was handed over, the Gestapo warned Roger that if he was ever caught escaping again, he would be shot. Quite a large party of us had come from Gulag Luft. That was the interrogation camp uh, in a special train. We got to the station in Sagan and out of the train and were marched up short distance towards the camp. You could see wide open space of dirty sand clearing in a pine forest, a lot of wooden huts surrounded with ample supply of barbed wire. All I thought was, well, this is going to be home for the rest of the war. My darlings, here I am again. You will, I know, have had a very anxious and trying time, but I also know that you would have not expected me in the circumstances to have done anything other than I did. I am quite okay. I wouldn't worry about the photograph, by the way. It was taken on a bad day in winter, in a bad light, I was also probably in a bad temper. And I don't look any younger these days, but I'm very well, all things considered, and a month of decent, civilized life will put me back to normal. And I will have one great advantage. I will be very much wiser. I'm naturally very disappointed to have been caught again, but my spirits are sky high, and you need have no fear that this life has got me down yet or that it ever will, please God. Give yourselves all a big hug and lots of love from Roger. I met Roger in the camp. He was shot down long before I was. I was very fond of him. We used to have a lot of what I think was intelligent conversation anyway. He might not have done, <laughs> but I certainly did. We discussed yeah. everything, from women to anything else you'd like to talk about. <laughs> Shortly after his arrival, von Massow handed Roger a letter he had kept back until he was among friends. It was from Peggy Hamilton to say that she had married somebody else. I only heard about Peggy a couple of weeks ago. Don't waste any false sympathy on this because I find I don't really care a damn about it. I've told Harry to do what he can about the money, but if Peggy sticks her toes in, there's nothing I can do legally. The whole business is a bore and not worth discussing. Soon after this, Roger addressed the camp in words to this effect. Everyone here in this room is living on borrowed time. By rights, we should all be dead. The only reason that God allowed us this extra ration of life 
is so that we can make life hell for the Hun. Quite clearly, he was a formidable figure on the escaping front. Being what Crockett used to call escape-minded from a very early stage, he became what was known as X, that is, head of escapes for the entire camp, a very responsible business. He is very good at X, very good indeed. I mean, he had a very clear brain and knew exactly what he wanted and what he didn't want and what he expected of us. And that is very important because sometimes we wouldn't necessarily know what we wanted to do and he made it clear what we ought to do. He took charge um, and brought order and discipline into the whole process, which previously hadn't existed. I mean, if I decided it'd be a good idea to start a tunnel from here and see if I can tunnel out under the there, and you decided that you were going to start one there. Uh, they were all digging like bunnies, and you did got in each other's way, and um, Roger said, well, there must be a stop to this. No private enterprise tunnels allowed. We will dig three bloody deep, bloody long tunnels, and the word tunnel is taboo. They will be called Tom, Dick, and Harry. The genius behind Roger's idea of digging three tunnels simultaneously was that if one tunnel was found, the Germans would not suspect any others existed. They set about sinking three separate shafts from three different huts, each 25 feet deep and two feet square. And the tunneling began. I'm quite sure that Roger, although he ran the whole thing, I'm quite sure he didn't go down until it was absolutely dead, because he wouldn't even go in a tube if he could avoid it. He hated being underground. It was quite a phobia with him. In his role as Big X, his father's mantle fell upon him. Benji would have liked him to go into mining, and nothing it was going to induce him to go into mining. He hated the very thought of it. Now, ironically, his freedom depended on it. For the first time in his life, Roger needed his father's advice as a mining engineer. This was the one thing he could not write about in his letters. My darlings, only one letter from father this month. Now, what am I to write to you about? Hmm, the weather? It's dull like the countryside and our existence. My fellow human beings, they're ordinary and, alas, somewhat dull too. The war? But that's a topic worn threadbare in our daily lives, and a letter should be like a holiday. New world and new people, like a cinema. Enchantment for a short hour or so. Outside, people are lying about in the sun and overhead the pale blue German sky, so like those pale blue Aryan eyes, looks down with stolid indifference on us. Tomorrow, I'm 33. Hey ho, lots of love, Roger. In the early days, breakfast was just acorn coffee. Lunchtime, the watery sauerkraut soup and a few bad potatoes. So you got pretty darn hungry on that. People played football, and uh, but we didn't have the energy to play very enthusiastically. Roger harnessed the skills of the camp. He intended to get 200 men out. Each person would need civilian clothing, official papers, money, maps, compasses, and so forth. He personally selected the men to run these departments. He had to be able to get on with everybody, and he had to be able to detect their weaknesses and their strengths, which he was very good at doing, I might say. <laughs> very good. <laughs> and he soon let you know, too. <laughs> 600 people dug the three tunnels. I had no part in that, mercifully. I mean, I can't think of anything more horrible than, <laughs> than digging a tunnel. 
The only time I ever got near a tunnel was that we built this uh, ventilation pump. It was a double acting pump, two kit bags, right? And uh, the operator just sat there, sort of, so he was rowing and just pumping air down a pipeline because you couldn't breathe without a source of air once you've gone some considerable distance away from the shaft. And you've got all these teams of experts, like tailors and forgers and con men who bribed the guards. Escaping was the principal industry, of course. It occupied most people's time. Even if you um, were sanguine enough to, to know that your chances of, of um, getting out of the camp were slim and of getting home were almost negligible. The goons knew perfectly well that there were tunnels, so they just couldn't find them. They would only have needed one word in the wrong place, and of course they would have been found in no time. Because the Germans were pretty smart. <laughs> we might have thought them as idiots, but they weren't. <laughs> you never talked indoors, for example, because the Germans would have microphones and God knows what all over the place. Let's go and have a stroll or something like that, you see. And you knew what he meant. You only talked when you were on the circuit walking around. I've had a number of letters from Georgie Curzon, an old flame of mine. She's been busy divorcing her husband, who doesn't seem to have behaved very prettily. And now, poor Georgie is turning to her old love for comfort. I had not heard from her for years. I jolly nearly married her once. You didn't know that, did you? There was quite a bit of falling out and giving up and people not wanting to do the escape. Understandable. They'd had enough and wanted a quiet life. I wasn't one of them. I was one of the two leading teams of diggers. And just we went in there and dug the tunnel. That was it. My job was digging at the front, and then somebody behind me would be taking the sand away from me. That would be put on the trolley, and the trolley was taken up, and the trolley was brought back again for another load. We built sort of a railway, as you might say. Six inches beneath the topsoil was yellow sand. The sight of the sand anywhere in the camp immediately informed the German ferrets that a tunnel was being dug. Peter Fanshaw invented an inner trouser device from Long John's, which they filled up with sand as it came out of the tunnel twice a day. They would then walk to the fence, pull a string. The sand fell down over their shoes and they'd kick it into the ground. These men became known as penguins because if they waddled, they were detected by the ferrets. The camp is filling up, and we're about 1,500 strong. Newcomers, very optimistic, especially about the effect of our particular efforts. As everybody in Sarajevo 3 was air crew, by definition, they were young, and also they were intelligent, because if you were that stupid, you couldn't really fly an aeroplane. Right? Um, and so all sorts of activities emerged, the theater being obviously one. A room with a view on you, and no one to give advice. That sounds a paradise view, go fail to change. I've now taken to the boards in the camp theater as a fat and worried old stockbroker who gets the wind up about the world and his own affairs at 5 a.m. in bed. It's an amusing play called Apprehensions, and the girls are played by fellow Kriechis, some of them astonishingly funny. 
We'll be as happy and contented as birds upon a tree, high above the mountains and sea. We'll build and we'll coo. I had the advantage of, of being a rather pretty boy, and so I was suitable for female roles. <laughs> and we did hire special dresses from some theatrical agency in Berlin or something like it was, which enabled us to look um, properly dressed. <laughs> That's not to say that the tailoring department was, a, was very skilled. It was primarily occupied in producing escaping gear, not theatrical gear. Don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington. Don't put your daughter on the stage. She's a bit of an ugly duckling, you must honestly confess. And the we didn't get any propositions, but uh, <laughs> this was a shame, I suppose. Please, Mrs. Worthington, don't put your daughter on the stage. In the ordinary mail, the prisoners watched out for ingeniously hidden devices. Among the things that MI9 sent in, perfectly ordinary parcels, were, of course, clothes and blankets. If you looked very carefully at the blankets, much more carefully than the Germans ever did, you could see that if you could take a knife to them, you could cut them down and turn them into an officer's greatcoat. German officer's greatcoat. The locus classicus is the pack of playing cards. You drop them in a bucket, all the cards come off, and there's a very detailed map of the frontier into Switzerland inside. Monopoly boards. Take the monopoly board off, and there's a map of Germany inside. All sorts of devices of this sort were prepared. December 1943. Thanks to the Red Cross, we're the best fed people in Europe. We had quite a comic Christmas with lots of Red Cross food and home brewed booze, which had to be tasted to be believed, but which produced the necessary oblivion, which is all that is required in a place like this. We're all bubbling over with optimism at the moment, and I personally. I'm quite certain we've had our last Christmas here. It was indeed Roger's last Christmas behind the wire. His prediction about the three tunnels had come true. Tom had been discovered the year before when it was within 20 yards of the wood. The Germans did not suspect other tunnels and Dick was used for storage. By March 1944, Harry was ready. And Harry got right through. It was 120 yards long, with an exit comfortably outside the wall. The whole venture had taken 18 months to achieve. 200 men were fully equipped and ready to go. I'm beginning to believe that it can be possible to transfer yourself to another part of the world or even to other worlds with your mind. We Europeans know little about it, but the Indian philosophies appear to put it into practice and all the older religions teach it. And I'm going to do Higgins in Pygmalion. Lots of love, Roger. He gave us a talk in the theatre, general briefing of what was going to happen. I think he gave, first of all, warning to people uh, to dress properly, uh, not to be too bulky, not to have great big suitcases, otherwise they'd not tunnel down. All the passes were stamped and uh, rations issued and compasses uh, mapped uh, and so on. Roger said, right, well, we'll go now, which was, uh, of course, the 24th. My darlings, 
I'm well and full of confidence as usual. Next installment, next month. Bless you all. Roger. This was the last letter Roger wrote. The last letter ever received by the family. The tunnel was opened up and the escape began. When you got to the very end, where you were actually doing the escape, that had to be very careful done. Then that just went straight up. And we had sort of a ladder to go up and get out. Oh, it was wonderful. The fresh air that came in when you opened the top. Hmm? It was a wonderful feeling. It was absolutely gushed down. I came out onto the snow. It was jolly cold. You had to get across a little bit of open space before you could get to something to uh, conceal you. I made the wood and I thought, oh, free at last, first time for four years. Roger was the fourth man out of the tunnel. He chose Bernard Chedour, whose family were in the French resistance, as his partner. They moved swiftly through the woods and arrived at Zagen station, where Roger bought two tickets to Breslau. A hundred miles away, the RAF began to bomb Berlin. Roger was dressed in a well-cut tweed suit with Trilby hat, a great coat and a small attaché case. He looked exactly the part of a prosperous French businessman, and he was in very good spirits and convinced he was going to get home. A train came in. Several escapees hastily boarded it. The driver was in a hurry. Des Plunkett tells how Roger, without a flicker of recognition, walked down the carriage and squeezed his hand, indicating they were all still in charge. Back at the camp, 76 men had escaped by 5 a.m. when a guard finally saw one of them by virtually bumping into him. A single shot rang out, but nobody was hurt. Hitler was immediately informed. He flew into a rage and ordered that every single recaptured prisoner was to be shot. Cautioned that this would cause an international outcry, he reduced the number to 50. The reason to be given was that prisoners were shot while trying to escape. This order went out to every Gestapo office in the country. By 8 a.m., almost every railway station, every crossing was alerted. It was later estimated that five million Germans were deployed to find the men. At Breslau, Roger bought two tickets to Paris. He and Schedur crossed Germany and arrived at Zabuchen within walking distance of the French border. Flight Lieutenant von Weimersch, another escapee, saw them board the train at Breslau. Later in the day, he himself was arrested at Metz. The Gestapo officer was immensely impressed with his forged papers. But, he added triumphantly, You do not have the new special mark. Every week, every day sometimes now, we add a small, a special mark to a document. You're not the first one to be caught. He caught two very clever ones, smartly dressed in good suits, briefcases, perfect French and German business executives traveling to Paris. No special mark. We have them. Roger Bushel and Bernard Chedour. In Saarbrücken, the regional chief of the Gestapo, Dr. Leopold Spann, 
ushered Roger and Bernard Chedeur into his office. His secretary, Gertrude Schmidt, noticed that they were handcuffed in front. A few minutes later, Dr. Spann came out. He ordered her to type two death certificates. Around 4 a.m., he rang his chauffeur, Walter Breithaupt, to pick him up with his deputy, Emil Schultz. Roger and Bernard were then collected from the Kripo prison. The chauffeur, Walter Breithaupt, remembers. Schultz fastened the hands of each prisoner with handcuffs and sat between them. The bigger of the two, Bushel, said to Schultz in German, that it was not compatible with the honor of an officer. I drove 40 kilometers and then turned onto the Autobahn towards Mannheim. Nobody spoke during the drive. After about four to five kilometers, Span ordered me to stop the car. He got out with Schultz. Both lit cigarettes and moved out of hearing. They returned, and one of them said to the prisoners that they could get out and relieve themselves. Sven told them they would get shot if they tried to escape. I stood next to the car by the driver's seat. Both prisoners stood about two meters off the road to relieve themselves, while Spann and Schulz stood a meter behind them with the pistols in their hands. I found out Roger was shot uh, was because it was all over the newspaper. It was reported in the newspaper uh, that uh, 72 escapees uh, escaped, that it was quite successful. And that time I heard that nobody made it back. But then after the war, uh, it was found out that about three or four actually made it. Hitler's orders were obeyed. Over the next few days, 50 recaptured men were shot. We saw a little paragraph in the Fulkeshire Bearbachter saying that um, Anthony Eden had made a protest in the House of Commons uh, about these 50 officers who were, had been shot trying to escape. And he made a protest to the German government. Um, uh, well, it could only have been uh, the, um, our, uh, our friends. Rather wonder why the hell you, were, you yourself weren't, weren't shot. Hmm? That's where Jimmy and I felt anyway. Uh, why we weren't shot. We could have been. It was just luck. And um, pretty terrible. And it was a nasty shock all round because they were all prisoners of war and under the Geneva Convention were bound to be preserved by the captain power. And we now know that they were shot on Hitler's personal order. 23 were returned to prison of war camps. Jens Muller and Per Bergsland got all the way home to Norway and Bob von der Stuck to England. True to form, the Gestapo cremated the bodies of the 50 who were shot and returned their ashes to the camp in caskets. Roger's brave stance for freedom against tyranny 
for which he was prepared to die, was not lost on us as we played in my grandfather's study. In the scramble of advancing armies, Roger's casket was broken, so his ashes lie here, in this place, in this forest. My grandmother wrote a poem. To Roger Bushell, squadron leader in the RAF, and 49 gallant comrades who died with him. With bare, earth-stained hands and their brave hearts, they faced unarmed the bestial Nazi rage. Their young bodies fell riddled with steel to rest together in a common grave. But with joy their spirits came their freedom from frustration, longing, prison bars. With glad shouts they fled across the border to that new life where they can earn God's wage. They will be paid for service with that peace which passeth all our human understanding, with love that has no earthly dross to cloud it, with knowledge woven from celestial strands. And we, left here who so well knew and loved them, must rise above the cruel loss and pain. With courage we must follow in their footsteps so that in freedom we may meet again. are looking a bit precarious, but the consumers are revolting next tonight on BBC4, which interests to protect the final part of Power to the People is here in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> 